Good evening, good evening. Thank you so much for coming out and braving the autumn. So we're calling this a mid-autumn's night dream, but thank you for being here. My name is Christina Keefe. I'm the director of the theater program and of this production. A couple of things before we get started. So the first two scenes are here where you guys are now. The actors will be working between these two trees and a little bit on the steps here. And then Puck and the fairies will come out and lead you to Fairyland. So that will, and then the rest of the show will be taking place over in what we're calling the forest. I know you're going to enjoy this show. Have a great time. Thank you for coming. Our draws on apace. Four happy days bringing a new moon. But oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Philistrate, stir up the Athenian youth to merriment. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love doing thee injuries. But I shall wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? A full of vexation, Kamara, with complaint against my child. My daughter, Hermia. Uh, stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand <laughs> forth, Lysander, and my gracious duke. This man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart and turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius, I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, and I may dispose of her which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but in this kind, what's in your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked, but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood. Whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. Thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage, but earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord. Here I will my virgin paint up unto his lordship, whose then we should yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day, betwixt my love and me, for everlasting bond of fellowship. Upon that day, I prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest, for I austerity in single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazed title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? <laughs> Scornful Lysander, true, he hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him. And she is mine. And all of my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius. And which is more than all these boasts can be? I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should I not then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nidor's daughter, Helena, and won her soul, and she, Sweet lady, 
dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof. But being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But come, Demetrius, <laughs> and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look that you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate to death or to avow a single life. Come, Hippolyta. What cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you in something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we follow you. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Belike for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. Ay, me! For aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood. Oh, cross, too high to be enthralled too low. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, spite! Too old to be engaged, too young. Or else misgraft in respect of years. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Or if there were sympathy and choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream. So quick bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience for it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancy's followers. A, a good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. And to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me then, steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena to do observance to a morn of May, there will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee, by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow in the golden head, by all the vows that ever men have broke, in number more than ever women spoke, in that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. And Godspeed, fair Helena. Whither away? Call you me fair, that fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair. O oh, happy fair, your eyes are load stars, and your tongue's sweet air, more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear when wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear. Sickness is catching o'er oh, favor, so yours would I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius' heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smile such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers would such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty would that fault were mine. But take comfort, he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself shall fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then what graces in my love do dwell, that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time when lovers' flights doth still conceal, from Athens' gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood, where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger companies. Oh, farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. <laughs> I will, my Hermia. <laughs> Helena, add you, as you on him, Demetrius, dote on you. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she, but what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. 
He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, folding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste, wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste, and therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyne, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her, and for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Is all our company here? You were best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here's the scroll of every man's name which thought fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you. And a Mary. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. Answer as I call you. Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready, name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus, a lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms, I will condole in some measure. <laughs> to the rest. Yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Heracles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in to make all split. <laughs> the raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus' car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fates. <laughs> this was lofty. Now name the rest of the players. This is Heracles vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe, a wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. <laughs> Nay, Faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard. Come here. That's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. Oh, and I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe too. <laughs> I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisbe, Thisbe. Oh, Pyramus, love me. Play Thisbe, dear and lady, dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus. And flute, you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. <laughs> Tom Snap, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus's father. Yes. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug the joiner. You, the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you if it be given me, for I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Oh, let me play the lion too. <laughs> I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will make the duke say, let him roar again. Let him roar again! And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the Duchess and the ladies that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That, that would hang, hang us, every mother's son. I grant you, friends, that if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you and twere any nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus. <laughs> For Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. Masters, here are your parts. And I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night and meet me in the passwood, a mile without the town by moonlight. 
There will we rehearse, for if we meet in the city, we shall be dogged with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of property such as our play ones. I pray you, fail me not. We will meet, and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. <laughs> Take pains, be perfect, adieu. At the Duke's oak we meet. Enough, hold or cut bowstrings. Ha! ha, -ha! Yeah! How now, spirit? Whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, through brush, through briar, over park, over pale, through flood, through fire, I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere. And I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be. In their gold coat spots, you see, those be rubies, fairy favors in those speckles of their savers. I must go seek some dewdrops here and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen and all our elves come here anon. The king doth keep his revels here tonight. Take care the queen come not within his sight, for he is passing fell and wrath, for she, as her attendant, hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling. Either I mistake your shape and making quite, or else you'd be that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery? Those that hobgoblin call you sweet puck. You do their work, and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Thou speak'st aright. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest for Oberon and make him smile. But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. And here, my mistress, would that he were gone. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What, jealous Oberon? Fairies, skip hence, I have forsworn his bed and company. Tarry, rash wanton, and not I thy lord. Then I must be thy lady. Why art thou here? come from the farthest step of India, but that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your buskined mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? These are the forgeries of jealousy, and never since the middle summer spring Met we on hill, in dale, forest, or mead, by paved fountain, or by rushy brook, or in the beached margent of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And through this distemperature we see the seasons alter, Hoary-headed frosts, far in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old Heim's thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is, as in mockery, set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter change their wanted liveries, and the mazed world, by their increase, now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not the child of me. His mother was a votress of my order. But she, being mortal, of that boy did die, and for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus' wedding day? If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. 
If not, shun me and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy and I will go with not thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies, away. We shall chide downright if I longer stay. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle puck, come hither. Thou rememberest, since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember. That very time I saw but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid, all armed, and a certain aim he took at a fair vestal throned by the west and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell, it fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb, and be thou here again ere the leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep, and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing she then waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or on busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render Get up her gone. page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible, and I will overhear their conference. <laughs> I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. <laughs> Thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and here I am and woed within this wood because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, get thee gone and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, and yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow Do you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not, nor I cannot love you? And even for that, do I love you the more? I am your spaniel! And Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you! Use me but as your spaniel! Spurn me! Strike me! Neglect me! Lose me! Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you! What worser place could I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog? Tempt not too much the hate of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much. To leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not. To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Your virtue is my privilege. For that, it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore, I think I am not in the night. Nor doth this wood lack worlds of company, for you, in my respect, are all the world. Then how can it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee and hide me in the brakes, and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts. The wildest hath not such a heart as you! I will not stay thy questions! Let me go! Or if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. I, in the temple, the town, the field, you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius! Your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed, and we're not made to woo. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell, to die upon the hand I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he seek thy love. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Aye, there it is. <laughs> I know a bank where a wild thyme blows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grows quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Affect it with some care that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. Come now around Ellen 
a fairy song. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices and let me rest. You spotted snakes with double tongue, with double Stand sentinel. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake. Be it ox or cat or bear, pard or boar with bristled hair, in thy eye that shall appear. When thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood, and to speak troth, I have forgot our way. We'll rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander, find you out of bed, for I, upon this bank, will rest my head. One turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One bed, one heart, two bosoms, and one troth. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet, do not lie so near. Oh, take the sense, sweet, of my innocence. Love takes its meaning in love's conference. I mean that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms, interchained in an oath, so then two bosoms and a single troth. Then by your side no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. <laughs> Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much be true my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But, gentle friend, for love and courtesy, lie further off in human modesty. Such separation, as may well be said, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant. 
and good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet life end. <laughs> amen, amen to that fair prayer, say I. And then in life, when I end loyalty, <sighs> here is my bed. Uh, sleep give thee all the rest. With half that wish, the wish's eyes be pressed. Through the forest have I gone, but Athenian found I none on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force in stirring love. <gasps> Night and silence, who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despised the Athenian maid. <gasps> and here the maiden, sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty so. She durst not lie near this slack love, this skill courtesy. Churl, upon thine eye I throw all the power this charm doth owe. <laughs> when thou wakest, let love forbid sleep his seat on thine eyelid. So awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. <laughs> Stay, though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou, darkling, leave me? Do not so. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy be Harmia, wheresoe'er she lies. For she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not with salt tears. If so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear. But who is here? Lysander? On the ground? Dead or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. And run through fire would I for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena, nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though he love your Hermia, Lord, what though? Yet Hermia still loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? No! I do repent the tedious minutes with her I have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love, who will not change a raven for a dove. The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve this scorn? It's not enough, it's not enough, young man, that I did never, no, nor never can, deserve a sweet look from Demetrius' eye. But you must flout my insufficiency? Good troth, you do me wrong. Good sooth, you do, in such disdainful manner, me to woo. But fare ye well. Perforce, I must confess, I thought you, Lord, of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused should of another therefore be abused. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayst thou come Lysander near. For as a surfeit of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to my stomach brings, or as Thy heresies that men do leave are hated most by those they did deceive. So thou, my surfeit and my heresy, of all be hated but the most of me, and all my powers address your love and might to honor Helen and to be her knight. Help me, Lysander! Help me do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast! Ay me, for pity, what a dream was here! Lysander, look how I do quake with fear. Methought a serpent eat my heart away, and you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander? What? Removed? Lysander? Lord? What? Out of hearing? Gone, no sound, no word. Alack, where are you? Speak, and if you hear speak of all loves, I swoon almost with fear. No, then I well perceive you all not nigh. Either death or you I'll find immediately. <laughs> Our 
Are we all met? Pat, Pat. And here's a marvelous and convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This hawthorn break our tiring house. And we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How answer you that? Fire lack and a parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all's done. Not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue. And let the prologue seem to say that we do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. Oh, for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight and six. Uh, no, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? Uh, I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in... God shield us, a lion amongst ladies is a most dreadful thing. For there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must say he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck. And he himself must, be, must speak through, saying thus, or to the same defect, Ladies, or, or fair ladies, I would wish you or I would request you, or I would entreat you not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man as other men are. And there indeed let him name his name and tell them plainly he is Snug the Joiner. Well, it shall be so. But there is two hard things. That is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber. For, you know, Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine on the night we play our play? A calendar, a calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out moonshine! Find out moonshine! Aye, it doth shine that night! Yes. Why? Then you may leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play open, and the moon may shine into the casement. Aye. Or else... One must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyramus and Thisbe says the story did talk through the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify wall. And let him hold his fingers thus, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come, sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse her parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so everyone according to his cue. <gasps> what hempen homespuns have we swaggering here? So near the cradle of the fairy queen. What? A play toward? I'll be an auditor, an actor too, if I see cause. <laughs> Speak, Pyramus. Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savors sweet. Odors! Odors! <laughs> Odors savors sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe dear. But hark! A voice. Stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger pyramus than e'er played here. <sighs> must I speak now? Aye, Mary, must you, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard, and is to come again. Most radiant pyramus. Ahem. <clears throat> Most radiant pyramus? Ahem. <clears throat> Most radiant pyramus. Most lily white of you. Of color like the red rose on triumphant briar. Most brisky juvenile and eek most lovely Jew. As true as true as Taurus that yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninus tomb, man. Well, you must not speak that yet. That you speak to Pyramus. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is passed. It is never tire. As true as true as Taurus that yet would never tire. <laughs> If I were fair, Thisbe, I were only thine. Oh, monstrous! Oh, strange! 
We are haunted! Brain masters, fly masters, help! I'll follow you, I'll lead you about around, through bog, through bush, through break, through grass. Sometimes a horse will be, sometimes a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometimes a fire, and neigh, and bark, and grunt, and roar, and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me afeard. Oh, Bottom, thou art changed. W what do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Bless thee, Bottom, bless thee. Thou art translated. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to, to fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place, do what they can. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing that they shall hear that I am not afraid. Ah! The oozle cock so black of hue, with orange tawny bill, the throstle with his note, so true the wren with little quill. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo gray, whose note full many a man does mark and dares not answer. Nay. Uh, for indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry cuckoo never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored to thy note. So is mine eye much enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtues force perforce doth move me on the very first to say, to swear, I love thee. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Uh, nay, I can gleek upon occasion. <sighs> Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so, neither. Uh, but if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state. And I do love thee, therefore go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I shall purge thy mortal grossness so, that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom, cobweb, moth and mustard seed. Ready. And I. And I. And I. Where, Where shall, shall we go? go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Nod to him, elves, and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal. Hail. 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 I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb. I shall desire you of more acquaintance, good master Cobweb. Uh, if I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, honest gentleman. Peas Blossom. I pray you, uh, commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and to Master Peace God, your father. Good Master Peace Blossom, I shall desire you of more acquaintance, too. Your name, I beseech you, sir. Mustard Seed. Good Master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. Uh, that same cowardly, giant-like ox beef hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. Uh, I promise your kindred had made my eyes water ere now. I desire your more acquaintance, good Master Mustard Seed. Come, lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Yeah. Tie up my love's tongue. Bring him silently. <laughs> Thank you.
wonder if Titania be awaked, then what it was next came in her eye, which she must dote upon in extremity. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with the monster is in love. Near to her close and consecrated bower, when she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus' nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented, in their sport forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, an ass's no eye fixed upon his head. Anon his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes. When him they spy at his sight, away his fellows fly, and at our step here o'er and o'er one falls. He murder cries, and help from Athens calls. I led them on in this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there. When in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked and straightway loved an ass. This falls out better than I could devise. Yet hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with a love juice as I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, that is finished too. And the Athenian woman by his side, when he awakes, of force she must be eyed. Fair Hermia. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Stand close, this is the same Athenian. Oh, this is the woman, but not this the man. Well, why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse. For thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being o'er shoes and blood, plunge in the deep and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? It cannot be, but thou hast murdered him! So should a murderer look, so dead, so grim! So should the murdered look, and so should I, pierce through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? <laughs> I had rather give his carcass to my hounds. Out, dog! Out, cur! Thou dragest me past the bounds of Vedas' patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more. And from thy hated presence part I so, see me no more, where he be dead or no. Oh, no, you... <laughs> there is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain, so sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, for debt that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, which now in some slight measure it will pay, if for his tender, here I make some stay. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love sight. Of thy misprision must perforce ensue some true love turned, and not a false turned true. Then fate or rules that one man holding troth a million fail, confounding oath on oath. About the wood go swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens look thou find. All fancy sick she is, and pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. By some illusion see thou bring her here, and I will charm his eyes against she do appear. I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than the arrow from the Tartar's bow. <laughs> Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink in apple of his eye. When his love he doth espy, let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Captain of our fairy band, Helena is here at hand, and the youth mistook by me, pleading for his lover's fee. Shall we there fond pageancy? Lord, what fools these mortals be! A manly enterprise! Helena! Stand aside. The noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. <gasps> oh, then we'll two at once will one. That must needs be sport alone, for these things do best please me that befall preposterously. <laughs> Why should you think that I should woo and scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow, I weep, and vow so born in their nativity, all truth appears. How can these things in me seem false to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, oh, 
devilish holy fray. These vows are Hermia's. Will you give her or? I had no judgment when to her, I swore. Nor none in my mind now you give her or. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. Oh, Helena. <laughs> Goddess, nymph, perfect, divine. To what, my love, shall I compare thine eyne? Oh, crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripe and show thy lips those kissing cherries tempting grow. Oh, spite! Oh, hell, I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and new courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me, as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me too? If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so to vow and swear and super praise my parts when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia. And now both rivals to mock Helena. You are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so, for you love Hermia. This you know I know. And here, with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love I yield you up my part, and yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander, keep thy Hermia. I will none. If e'er I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her but as guestwise sojourned. And now to Helen it is home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to thy peril thou abide it, dear. Oh, look where thy love comes. Yonder is thy dear. Dark night that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick of apprehension makes. Thou art not by mine eye, Lysander, found. Mine ear, I think it, brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Why should he stay whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love that would not let him bide. Fair Helena, who more engilds the night than all you fiery o's and eyes of light. Why seek'st thou me? Could not this make thee know the hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think, it cannot be. Oh, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent when we have chid the hasty-footed time for parting us, oh, is all forgot? All school days, friendship, childhood, innocence, and will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly, tis not maidenly. Our sex as well as I may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face and made your other love Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph, divine and rare, precious celestial? Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love, so rich within his soul and tender me, forsooth, affection, but by your setting on, by your consent? I understand not what you mean by this. I do. Persever, counterfeit sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back. If you had any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare ye well, tis partly mine own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. Stay, gentle Helena, hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Oh, excellent! Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel no more than she entreat. <gasps> Thy threats have no more weight than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee by my life I do. I swear by that which I would lose for thee to prove him false that says I love thee not. <clears throat> I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. Quick, come! Lysander, where to tends all this? Away, you Ethiop! <laughs> no, no, he'll seem to break loose. Take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man, go! Hang off, thou cat! Thou burr! Vile thing, let loose, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent! Oh, what can I you grown so rude? What change is this, sweet love? Thy love? Out, tawny tartar! Out, loathed medicine, hated potion, hence! Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you! Uh, Demetrius, I will keep my word with you. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What, should I hurt her, strike her? kill her dead, although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What? Can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me, wherefore? Oh, me, what news, my love? Am not I Hermia? Are not you Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. 
And since night you loved me, and since night you left me, why then you left me, oh, the gods forbid in earnest, shall I say? I, by my life I did, and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh, oh me, you juggler, you kicker blossom, you thief of love. What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine, if faith. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you! Puppet? Why so? Aye, that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou pink and maple? Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach into thine eyes. Where <laughs> you go, you mock me, gentlemen. Let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think because she is something lower than myself that I can match her. Lower! Hark! Again! <laughs> Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia. Did ever keep your counsel, never wronged you. Save that in love unto Demetrius, I told him of your stealth into these woods. He followed you for love, I followed him, but he hath chid me hence and threatened me to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. And now, so you will let me quiet go to Athens, will I bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. Why get you gone? Who is it that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Oh, be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. Oh, when she's angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Little again! Nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her! <laughs> Get you gone, you dwarf, you minimus of hindering not grass maid! You bead, you acorn! You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. <clears throat> Speak not of Helena. Take not her part, for if thou dost intend uh, never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it! <laughs> now she holds me not. Now follow if thou darest to try whose right of thine or mine is most in Helena. Follow? I'll go with thee cheek by jowl. <laughs> you, mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, and go not back. I will not trust you, I, nor longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands and mine are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer, though, to run away. <laughs> I am amazed and know not what to say. This is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest, or else commits thy knaveries willfully. <laughs> Believe me, king of shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far, blameless proofs my enterprise, for I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. <laughs> and so far, I'm glad it so did sort, for this, their jangling, I esteem a sport. <laughs> thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. Hi, therefore, Robin, overcast the night, and lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way. Like to thy sander, sometime frame thy tongue, then stir up Demetrius in bitter wrong, and sometimes rail thou like Demetrius. And from each other, look, thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush the juice of this into Lysander's eye, whose liquor has this virtuous property to take from thence all error from his might, and make his eyeballs roll with wanted sight. When next they wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend, with league whose date till death shall never end. Whilst I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen, to beg her Indian boy, 
And then I will her charm at eye release for monster's view, and all things shall be peace. By fairy king, this must be done with haste, for night swift dragons do cut the clouds full fast. But we are spirits of another sort. I with morning's love have oft made sport, but notwithstanding haste, make no delay. This, we may affect this business yet ere day. <laughs> up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town, goblin lead them up and down. Here comes one. Where art thou proud, Demetrius? Speak thou now. Come, villain, drawn and ready. Where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me to plainer ground. Lysander, speak again. Thou run away, thou coward. Art thou fled? Speak. In some bush, where dost thou hide thy head? Thou coward, art thou bragging to the stars? Telling the bushes thou look'st for wars, but wilt not come? Ha! Come, recreant, come, thou child. I'll whip thee with a rod. He is the file that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice, we'll try no manhood here. Goes before me, and still he dares me on. When I come where he calls, then he is gone. The villain is much lighter healed than I. I followed fast, but faster he did fly. That, oh, fallen am I in dark, uneven way, and here will rest me. Come, thou gentle day, for if but once thou show me thy gray light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. How, oh, coward, comest thou not? Abide me if thou darest, for well I wot thou runnest before me, shifting every place, and dare not stand nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Come hither, I am here. Nay, then thou mockst me. Thou shalt buy this, dear, if... Oh, ever thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. Faintness constraineth me to measure out my length on this cold bed. By day's approach, look to be visited. Oh, weary night! Oh, long and tedious night! Abate thy hour! Shine comforts from the east that I may back to Athens by daylight from these that my poor company detest and sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye, steal me a while from mine own company. Yet but three. <laughs> Come, one more. Two of both kinds makes up four. <sighs> oh, here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Never so weary, never so in woe, be dabbled with the dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My feet can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. Heaven's shield, Lysander, if they mean a fray. On the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover, remedy. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye, and the country proverb known, that every man shall have his own. In your waking shall be shown, Jack shall have Jill, naught shall go ill. The man shall have his mare again, and all will be well. <laughs> Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk-roses in thy sleek, smooth head, and kiss thy fair, large ears, my gentle joy. Where's Peas Blossom? Ready. Scratch my head, Peas Blossom. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready. Monsieur Cobweb, good monsieur, get you your weapons in your hand, and kill me a red-hipped humblebee on the top of a thistle. And, good monsieur, bring me the honey bag. Do not fret yourself too much in the action, good monsieur. And, good monsieur, have a care the honey bag break not. I would be loath to have you overflown with the honey bag, senor. 
Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Oh, ready. Give me your knee, Monsieur Mustard Seed. Pray you leave your courtesy, good Monsieur. What's your will? Nothing but to help Cavalry Cobweb to scratch. I must to the barbers, Monsieur, for me thinks I am marvelous hairy about the face. And I am such a tender ass. If my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. What? Wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. Or, say, sweet love, what thou desirest to eat. Truly a peck of provender. I could want your good dry oats. Methinks I have a great desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay hath no fellow. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee new nuts. I had rather have a handful or two of dried peas. Uh, but I pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have an exposition of sleep come upon me. Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. So doth the wood bind the sweet honeysuckle gently and twist, the female ivy so enrings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee! How I dote on thee! Welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity, for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors from this hateful fool, I did abrade her and fall out with her. And when I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms did beg my patience, I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straight she gave me, and her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairyland. And now I have the boy, I will undo this hateful imperfection of her sight. And Robin, Take this transformed scalp from off the head of the Athenian swain, that he awakening when the other do, may all to Athens back again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first, I will release the fairy queen. Be as thou wast wont to be, see as thou wast wont to see, Dian's bud or Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon, what visions have I seen? Methought I was enamored of an ass. <laughs> there lies your love. How came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Silence a while. Robin, take off this head. Titania, music call, and strike more dead than common sleep of all these five of the sense. Music, ho! Music such as charmeth sleep. Now when thou wakest with thine own fool's eyes, peep. Sound, music. Come, my queen, take hands with me, and rock the ground whereon these sleepers be. Now thou and I are new in amity, and will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance in Duke Theseus' wedding triumphantly and blessed to all fair prosperity. There shall the pairs of faithful lovers be wedded with Theseus all in jollity. <laughs> my fairy king, attend and mark, I do hear the morning lark. Then, my queen, in silence sad, trip we after the night's shade. We the globe can compass soon swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight tell me how it came this night that I sleeping here was found with these mortals on the ground. Go, one of you, find out the forester. My love shall hear the music of my hounds. Uncouple in the western valley, let them go! Dispatch, I say, and find the forester. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. I was with Hercules and Cadmus once, when in a wood of Crete they bayed the bear with hounds of Sparta. Never did I hear such gallant chiding, for besides the groves, the skies, the fountains, every region near seemed all one mutual cry. I never heard so musical a discord, such sweet thunder. My hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind. Judge when you hear. But soft, what nymphs are these? My lord, this is my daughter here asleep, and this Lysander. 
This Demetrius's. This Helena, old Neater's Helena. I wonder if they're being here together. No doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing our intent, came here and grace our solemnity. But speak, Aegeus. Is this not the day that Hermia should give answer of her choice? It is, my lord. Go, bid the huntsmen wake them with their horns. Good morrow, friends! St. Valentine is past! Begin these wood birds but to couple now? Pardon, my lord! I pray you all stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world, that hatred is so far from jealousy, to sleep by hate and fear no enmity? My lord, I shall reply amazedly, half sleep, half waking. But as yet, I swear, I cannot truly say how I came here. But as I think, for truly what I speak, and as I do bethink me, so it is, I came with Hermia hither. Our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might, without the peril of the Athenian law, be... <sighs> enough, enough, my lord, you have enough! I beg the law, the law upon his head! They would have stolen away! They would, Demetrius, thereby to defeat you and me! You of your wife and me of my consent! Of my consent that she should be your wife. My lord, fair Helen told me of their stealth, of this their purpose hither to this wood. And I in fury followed them, fair Helen in fancy following me. But, my lord, I wot not by what power, but by some power it is. My love to Hermia melted as the snow. Seems to me now as the remembrance of an idle god, which in childhood I did dote upon. And all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. To her was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia, but as in sickness did I loathe this food, but as in health come to my natural taste. Now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse we more will hear or not. Aegeus, I will overbear your will, for in the temple, by and by with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. Away with us to Athens, three and three. We'll hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. These things seem small and undistinguishable. And methinks I see these things with parted eye where everything seems double. So methinks, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. Are you sure that we are awake? <laughs> it seems that yet we sleep, we dream. Do not you think the Duke was here and bid us follow him? Yea, and my father. And Hippolyta. And he did bid us follow to the temple. Why, then we are awake. Come, let us follow him. And by the way, let us recount our <laughs> dreams. When my cue comes, call me and I will answer. My next is, Most Fair Pyramus! <clears throat> Hi-ho! Peter Quince! A uh, snout, the tinker, flute, the bellowsman, the starveling! God's my life! Stolen hints and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream, past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. <laughs> Methought I was, and there is no man can tell what. Methought I was, and methought I had. But man is but a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. <laughs> the eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. And I shall sing it in the latter end of a play before the Duke. Peradventure, to make it the more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Have you sent to Bottom's house? Is he come home yet? He cannot be heard of. Out of doubt, he is transported. If he comes not, the play is marred. It goes not forward, doth it? It is not possible. You have not a man in all Athens able to discharge Pyramus but he. No, he hath simply the best wit of any handicraft man in Athens. 
Yay, and the best person too. And he is a very paramour for a sweet voice. You must say paragon. A paramour is, God bless us, the thing of naught. Masters! <laughs> The Duke is coming from the temple, and there is two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we had all been made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom. Thus hath he lost sixpence a day during his life. He could not have escaped sixpence a day, and the Duke had not given him sixpence a day for playing Pyramus. I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it. Sixpence a day in Pyramus or nothing. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Bottom! Oh! Oh, most courageous day, almost oh, happy hour. Masters, I am to discourse wonders. But ask me not what, for if I tell you I am no true Athenian, I will tell you everything right as it fell out. Let us hear, sweet Bottom. Not a word of me. All that I will tell you is the Duke hath dined. Get your apparel together, good strings to your beards, new ribbons to your pumps. Meet presently at the palace, and let every man look o'er his part. For the short and the long of it is, our play is preferred. In any case, let Thisbe have clean linen, and let not him that plays the lion pair his nails, for they shall hang out for the lion's claws. And, most dear actors, eat no onions nor garlic, for we are to utter sweet breath. And I do not doubt but to hear them say, it is a sweet comedy. No more words. Away, go away! that these lovers speak of. More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehends more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is, the madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye in fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination that if it but apprehends some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? But all the story of the night told over and all their minds transfigured so together more witnesseth than fancies images, and gross is something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Here come the lovers, full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. <laughs> More than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Come now, what masks, what dances shall we have to wear with this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revels are in hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Call, Philistrates! Here, Marty Theseus. Say, what abridgment have you for this evening? What mask? What dance? Is th how shall we beguile the lazy time if not with some delight? <laughs> There's a brief how many sports are ripe. Make choice of which your highness will see first. The battle with the centaurs to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp? <laughs> well, of none of that have I told my love and glory of my kinsman Hercules. The riot of the tipsy Bacchanals tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. That is an old device. It was played when I from Thebes came last a conqueror. The thrice three muses mourning the death of learning? Late deceased in beggary? That is some satire keen and critical. Not starting with the nuptial ceremony. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his lover Thisbe. Very tragical mirth? Merry and tragical, tedious and brief, that is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? A, a play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have ever known a play. But by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious. For in all the play there is not one word apt, one player fitted, and tragical it is, my noble lord, for Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which 
when I saw rehearse, I must confess, made mine eyes water. But more merry tears the passion of loud laughter never shed. What are they that do play it? O oh, hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which have never labored in their minds till now, now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it! <laughs> no, no, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing at all, unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. I will hear it, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and take your places, ladies. I love not to see wretchedness or charge and duty in his service perishing. Why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in this kind. The kind are we, to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake, and what poor duty cannot do, noble respect takes it in might, not merit. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity, in least speak most to my capacity. So please your grace, the royal prologue is addressed. Let him approach. <laughs> if we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will. To show our simple skill, that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then, we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to contest you, our true intent is. All for your delight, we are not here. That you should here repent you, the actors are at hand, and by their show you shall know all that you are like to know. This fellow doth not stand upon points. He hath rid his prologue like a rough cult. He knows not the stop. A good moral, my lord, it is not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, he hath played on his prologue like a child on a recorder. A sound, but not in government. His speech was like a, a tangled chain, nothing impaired, but all disordered. Who is next? <laughs> Gentles, perchance you wonder at the show, but wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know, this beauteous lady, Thisbe is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which did these lovers sunder, and through walls chink, poor souls, they are content to whisper, at the which let no man munder. This man with lantern, dog, and bush of thorn presenteth moonshine, for, if you will know, by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Nina's tomb, there, there to woo. This grisly beast, rich lion hight by name, the trusty Thisbe, coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright, and as she fled her mantle she did fall, which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds this trusty Thisbe's mantle slain, whereat, with blade, with bloody, blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling, bloody breast. And Thisbe, tearing in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. <laughs> For all the rest, that lion moonshine wall and lovers twain at large discourse while here they do remain. I wonder if the lion be to speak. No wonder, my lord. One lion may when many asses do. In this same interlude it doth befall that I, one snout by name, present a wall. And such a wall as I would have you think that had in it a crannied hole or chink through which the lovers Pyramus and Thisbe did whisper, often very secretly, this loam, this rough cast, and this stone doth show, that I am the same wall, the truth is so, and this the cranny is, right and sinister, through which the fearful lovers are, to whisper. Would you desire Lyman Hare to speak better? It is the wittiest partition that e'er I heard discourse, my lord. Pyramus draws near the wall, silence. Oh, grim-looked knight! O oh, night with hue so black, O oh, night, whichever art when day is not, O oh, night, O oh, night, alack, 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 I fear my Thisbe's promise is forgot, and thou, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet, O oh, lovely wall, thou stand'st between her father's ground and mine, thou wall. Oh, wall, oh, sweet, oh, lovely wall. Show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. Ooh. Thanks, courteous wall. Jove shield thee well for this. <gasps> but what see I? No Thisbe do I see. Oh, wicked wall through whom I see no bliss. Cursed be thy stones for deceiving me. Ooh. <laughs> 
The wall me thinks being sensible should curse again. Ah, uh, no, in truth, sir, he should not. Uh, deceiving me is Thisby's cue. She is to enter now, and I am to spy her through the wall. Uh, you shall see, it will fall pat as I told you. Yonder she comes. A wall? <laughs> Full often hast thou heard my moans for party by fair Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones. Thy stones with lime and hair did up in thee. I see a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe! My love thou art, my love, I think! Think what thou wilt, I am thy lover's grace, and like Lamander am I trusty still. And I like Helen till the fates me kill. Oh, kiss me through the hole in this vile wall. I kiss the wall's hole, not your lips at all. Wilt thou at Ninny's tomb? Ninus tomb! Ninny's tomb, meet me straightway. Tide life, tide death, I come without delay. Thus have I, Wall, my part discharged so, and being done, thus Wall away doth go. <laughs> this is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. The best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse if imagination amends them. And it must be your imagination and not theirs. If we imagine them no worse than they imagine themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts in, a man and a lion. Uh, you, ladies! You whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor may now perchance both quake and tremble here. When lion rough in wildest rage shall roar! Oh, then know that I, one snug the joiner, am. A lion fell, nor else no lion's dam. For if I should as lion come in strife into this place, to her pity on my life. A very gentle beast of a good conscience. The very best at a beast, my lord, that e'er I saw. His discretion, I am sure, cannot carry his valor, for the goose carries not the fox. It is well. Leave it to his discretion. Let us listen to the moon. <laughs> this lantern that the horned moon present. He should have worn the horns on his head. He has no crescent and his horns are invisible within the circumference. <laughs> oh! This lantern that the horned moon present, myself the man in the moon do seem to be. This is the greatest error of all the rest. The man should be put in the lantern. How else is it the man in the moon? He dares not come for the candle, for you see it is already in snuff. I am a weary of this moon. Would he change? It would appear by the small light of his discretion that he is in the wane. But yet, in courtesy, in all reason, we must stay the time. Uh, proceed, moon. <laughs> All I have to say is to tell you that that lantern is the moon. I, the man in the moon, this thorn bush, my thorn bush, and this dog, my dog. Why, all these things should be in the lantern, for you, all these things are in the moon. But silence, here comes Thisbe. This is old Nitty's tomb! Ninus tomb! Nitty's tomb! Where's my love? <laughs> ah! <laughs> ah! <laughs> well roared, lion. Well run, Thisbe! Well shown, moon. Truly the moon shines with a good grace. Well moused, lion! And so the lion vanished, <laughs> and then came Pyramus. Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, moon, for shining now so bright. For by thy gracious, golden, glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest these be sight. <gasps> but stay! Oh, spite! But mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here! Eyes, do you see? How can it be? Oh, dainty duck, oh dear! Thy mantle good, what stained with blood? Approach, ye furies fell! Oh, fates, come, come, cut thread and thrum, quail, crush, conclude, and quell. This passion and the death of a near friend would go near to make a man look sad. Be sure, my heart, but I pity the man. Oh! Wherefore, nature, didst thou lions frame, since lion vile hath here deflowered, my dear? Which is... No, no, 
Which was the fairest dame that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer? Come, tears confound, out sword and wound the pap of Pyramus. I that left pap where the heart doth hop. <laughs> ah! Thus die I, thus, thus, thus. <laughs> now am I dead? Now am I fled my soul into the sky? Tongue, lose thy light. Moon, take thy flight. <laughs> now die, 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 die! <laughs> no die for him, but an ace, for he is but one. Less than an ace, man, for he is dead, he is nothing. With the help of a surgeon, he may yet recover and prove an ass. <laughs> How chance Moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back and finds her lover? She will find him by starlight. Here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Methinks she should not use a long one for such a pyramus. I hope she will be brief. Asleep, my love? What? Dead, my dove? Oh, pyramus, arise! Speak, speak, quite dumb. Dead, dead. A tomb shall cover thy sweet eyes. These my lips. This cherry nose, these yellow cowslip cheeks are gone, are gone. Lovers make moans. Oh. His eyes were green as links. Oh, sisters three, come, come to me with hands as pale as milk. Lay them in gore, since you have sure with shears as thread of silk. Told not a word, come trusty sword, come my breast and you. And farewell, friends. Thus, this be ends. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Lion and Moonshine are left to bury the dead. Aye, and Wall too. <laughs> no, assure you, uh, the Wall is down that parted their fathers. Will it please you to see the epilogue or to hear a bergamask dance between two of our company? No, no epilogue. For your play needs no excuse. Never excuse, for when the players are all dead, there needs none to be blamed. <laughs> but come, your burger mask, let your epilogue alone. <laughs> One, two, ready, go! The iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve. Lovers, to bed. Tis almost fairy time. I fear we may outsleep the coming morn as much as we this night hath overwatched. This palpable gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed. A fortnight holds we this solemnity in nightly revels and new jollity. Now the hungry lion roars, and the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy plowman snores all with weary task for done. Now it is the time of night that the graves all gaping wide, every one lets forth their sprite through the churchway paths to glide. And we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun, following darkness like a dream, now are frolic. Not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Through the house give gathering light by the dead and drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite hop as light as bird from briar. And this ditty after me sing and dance it trippingly. First, rehearse your song by rote, to each word a warbling note. Hand in hand with fairy grace, will we sing and bless this place. From now until the break of day, through this house each fairy stray. Trip away, make no stay. Meet me all ere break of day.
If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme no more yielding than a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends! <laughs>